I don't know why it happened. It happens for different reasons for all of us. Uh, uh, I want to look at a passage of Scripture that shows not why they go wrong, but what to do when our kids do take the wrong path. So today I want us to look at a Scripture uh, that we, we heard up on the screen today. It's, uh, it's a story of the prodigal son. And being who, who I am, and you guys know my story, I've been on both sides of that. I, I have been the prodigal son, and I have had the prodigal children. And, and if anybody knows what I'm talking about, say amen, but don't raise your hand. <laughs> Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. A younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now instead of waiting until you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. There are three stages we're going to look at today. And stage one is rebellion. Every parent-child relationship has a power structure. From day one, the issue is going to be who's in control. And, and when they're born, the parents are 100% in control. But as they grow, the control shifts to the child. And, and kids want, want control a lot uh, quicker than parents want to give it to them sometimes. And it, it's the classic confrontation we see in verse 12. Father, I want my share of your estate, and I want it now. And how many of us remember, if I could just do as I please, be my own boss, not answer to anybody in this life, it would be so great. I'm so fed up being here. I just want to get out. Amen? We don't know how old this child was, 17, 18. But in verse 13 it tells us a few days later this youngster packed, the younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. He heads off to the Sunset Strip in Jerusalem. He's cruising down the, the boulevard in his Camelac. Gotta get that this morning. I thought that was pretty funny. Camelac. He's partying. He's having a great time. He's doing all those things that he always wanted to do. And the whole time, Mom and Dad's hearts are breaking. And what do we do? What do we do when your kid's old enough you can't control him or her anymore and they, and they just say, I'm out of here, I want to do things on my own, I, I'm going to leave. Let him go. Let him go. The Bible says he took a trip to a distant land. And if you notice in that, in that passage, the father didn't chase him down. He released him. From the time our kids are born, we're preparing for them to go out on their own, but the hardest thing that a parent can do is, is, is know when to hold on and, and when to let go. And I want, you know, what would you do if your 18 year old came to you and said, I want half my inheritance, I want it now, and I'm going to waste it? What would you say? And it seemed, you know, it seemed foolish to the prodigal father. He, he, you know, we, we know he tried to reason with his son probably, but he, he couldn't do any good. The young son was determined to leave. And you know, in life, the tighter we try to hold on, the, the tighter we try to hold on and control our children, the more it pushes them away. you got to let them all make their own mistakes. The Bible says he wasted all his money on wild living. First, everything's great. You know, it's party time. Uh, uh, everything that he was forbidden to do at home, he tries now. He throws his parents' whole value system out the window. He rejects his background. And he's wasting his life away. And do you think the father knew that he was going to waste that money? Without a doubt, he knew that. Do you think his... His son, do you think he knew his son was heading for trouble? Undoubtedly. Do you think he was tempted to send letters of advice to his son? Absolutely he was. And I know I've been there, and I've been tempted to do that same thing. But the father realized that there are some things that we can only learn, Terry Snyder, and that's through pain. Amen? The son's stubborn. He's going to have his way and he's going, to, he's going to go through the school of hard knocks. And I know that's risky. But that's the only way that we're going to learn. 
Every time we take responsibility for our kids, we take it away from them. We've got to let them make their own mistakes. Instead of stepping in for them and, and trying to think, make things better all the time, so we, we let them go and we let them make their own mistakes, and it's a, it's a tough thing in life to do. But it's not as tough as the next one. We've got to let them reap the consequences. <laughs> yeah. There's a price to pay for rebellion. In, in the Bible it says in Luke that about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. He persuaded the local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. About that time his money ran out, the great famine swept, swept over the land. Talking to the prodigals in here that remember when you were a prodigal? <laughs> not, not just one bad thing happened, did it? My money ran out, now famine sleeps over the land. You know, why couldn't my money just run out and there'd be food around here? But that's how it goes. That's how it goes. He hit the bottom. Hard times, the party's over, he's broke, he's friendless. Brother Terry, empty pockets, empty empty life, empty stomach. And, and how do you think his parents felt about this? You know, they were thinking, my kid's <laughs> suffering. I, I can't watch him. can't watch him do this anymore. He's hurt himself. And, and they were probably embarrassed, too. You can't get any lower than feeding slop to the pigs if you're a kosher Jew, I can tell you that. And, and they probably were, were uh, embarrassed. I remember when I was in my prodigal Chronicle days that my mom told me, she said, oh, now I'm going to have to move to Evansville. <laughs> I think maybe your Aunt Carmen will let me move in with her. The shame is just so great here in Spencer County that I'll never be able to hold my head up again. <laughs> Go on. So, so there is embarrassment for the family here. Every report is that's true, Tom. <laughs> Every report, you know it's true too, Mom. Don't sit back there. <laughs> Every report his parents heard about him made him want to die. It's like a knife in their heart. They're saying, why is my kid doing this to me? Where did I go wrong? And the, the fact is, we all make mistakes as parents. But you've got to realize you're not the only influence in your child's life. We've got to wake up to the fact that our kids make choices. They have friends we don't control. They read books we don't control. They have teachers we don't control. And it's not fair for us to take all that blame upon ourselves because it's not all our fault. We take a lot of false guilt on in our lives. We need to understand that parental responsibility ends at the same place a parent's control ends. If your kids have moved out of the house, you're no longer responsible for them. You can't take that responsibility. But the great temptation when our kids hit rock bottom is that we've got to intervene. We've got to make it soft on them. We've got to bail them out. We've got to... We got to fly out to see them wherever they're at. We got to send money, and and I'm gonna tell you another secret about my mom. She never bought into any of that. <laughs> I want her to bail me out. If she wouldn't do it. I want her to send me money, and she did. She didn't buy into that, and thank God she did. Amen. But, but the father in our story knew that nature had a way of, of disciplining his children that, that he could never do. And we don't want to short circuit the natural consequences of choices that our children make. If they make a choice and hit, hit rock bottom, sometimes they've got to reap the, the, the consequences of that. That's how we learn. And because this father in the Bible that we're looking at did not intervene, they went to stage two in this thing. Stage two is the reevaluation and regret. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, 
At home, even the hired men have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being your called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. If you notice the attitude change, when, he, when he's leaving, he says, give me, give me. When he comes back, he's saying, take me. A difference in attitude. His attitude is now an attitude of submission. And he goes through this stage of reevaluation. He begins to wise up and, and face the facts of what's going on. What am I really doing here? I made a, I made a whole mess out of my life. I'm here slopping the pigs. I've lost all my money, all my food, all my friends. Everything's gone. My life is a mess. And you know what? I just, I, I've discovered something. And it's this. Brother Terry, Brother Tommy, you guys know, probably agree with me. We never change until we're desperate. We never change until we're desperate. And some of you, your kids might not be desperate enough right now. They're going to have to hit rock bottom first. But other than here, I don't know, maybe, maybe your kid's right where this kid was at the turning point, turning it around. And then we, we, we need to know what do we do. We pray. Pray for your kids. Pray and pray and never stop praying for them. And there's not a day goes by that I don't pray for each one of my kids by name and for the personal situation that I see them in, and, and they're not the only ones. I pray for, I pray for my, my uh, nieces and nephews and Ben. I pray for you. I pray for the, uh, you as you're going to go off to college. But we just got to keep praying and praying for them. Our kids are under attack from the enemy at all times, and we have to pray all the time. It's our duty as parents to pray for our children, for our, for our nieces, for our nephews, for our grandchildren. Whether they're serving God or serving the enemy, we have got to pray. Another thing we've got to do is commit them to God. One of the most comforting things for me as a parent is knowing things that are out of my control are not out of God's control. Well, God's not going to force His will on anybody. He has the ability to guide, direct, and convict so that if my child ever opens his, his or hers ears, they will, they, they will, God will speak that word of truth to them. They will hear that word of truth spoken into their lives. And another thing we've got to do is wait patiently. Wait and wait and sometimes wait and wait some more. Some of you right now might be in that waiting period. Some of you might have been there for years. Sometimes it takes longer for others, but don't short-circuit God's natural discipline. Now I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking about a grade school of kids. Here. I'm talking about a teenager who's, who's, who's in rebellion, saying, I'm getting out of here. You pray, you commit, and you wait. Because that's the steps we gotta take. That's the steps we gotta take. And because the Father who's in this story represents God, the perfect Father. He did it just right, so they came to the third stage. The return. How you handle the return of your child is absolutely critical. The Bible says, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long distance away, the father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, he embraced him, and he kissed him. Remember that this is the ideal father and he did three things. And these are the same things that we need to do when our child right wise and up. What do we do? Love them faithfully. When the father saw him, the Bible said he was filled with love and compassion. No matter how far they fall, no matter how long you wait, you've got to leave the door open. You've got to love them faithfully. And it's got to be that stubborn kind of love that will not give up no matter what, they, what they're doing or where they've been. It, it's got to be that love that, that latches on and you just love them to death. You don't bail them out. 
you don't bail them out, you got to let them reap the consequences. Because for some, some people, that's the only way you're going to learn to face the consequences of decisions that we make. And I'll tell you what, that is tough. That is tough. Sometimes that means spending some time in jail. Sometimes you got to watch them spend some time in jail. They have to get rock bottom. It may be an unwanted pregnancy. It may be a drug addiction. We don't like those things, but they're out of our control anyway. We've got to be ready when they wise up that we love them faithfully. Next thing is accept him unconditionally. He ran to his son, he embraced him, and he kissed him. This is a picture of acceptance. Open arms. He didn't wait for his son to get back home. He saw him coming, and he ran out to him. And he didn't set any conditions on that love. When, he, when his son got there, he didn't say, Oh man, go get a bath, a haircut, then I'll hug him. His father runs out and hugs him in a bear, big bear hug. It was unconditional love. And here's the question that some people might be asking right now. Is how do I accept him or her without lowering my standards? And the answer is you don't have to. And this is very important. I want you to understand this. You've got to understand the difference between acceptance and approval. You can accept someone without approving of their lifestyle. Jesus accepted everyone. Everyone, the sinners of the religious people called it. He accepted everyone without approving of their lifestyle. We as Christians are called to love everybody to accept everyone without saying, what you're doing is fine, I approve of it. We don't have to do that. You can accept a child in rebellion without approving of their lifestyle. When, you're, when your child knows that they are accepted unconditionally, it makes it so much easier for them to come back and, and admit the wrongs. And, and uh, uh, they do that because they know they're accepted no matter what. Notice the son's confession. Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. You know he practiced this. We heard him rehearse it earlier in the, in the scripture. Do we make it easy for our kids to admit when they were wrong? Usually when children come back home after a time of rebellion, there needs to be a mutual confession. I've done some things wrong. You've done some things wrong. But we love you unconditionally, stubbornly, and we accept you back at Hear that, Mom? <laughs> Forgive them completely. If and when they come home, you forgive them completely. The Bible says, But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his fingers, sandals for his feet, and kill the calf that we've been fattening in the pen. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead, and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. God doesn't rub it in. God doesn't rub it in. He rubs it out. Amen? Amen. The father didn't say, I told you so. I knew this was going to happen. I knew you'd waste your life. When the son comes home, and at this point, the last thing that kid needed was a sermon, because life had given him a sermon, hasn't he? Rather than rubbing it is, his father gives him a second chance. And that's what we're to do. Forgive them completely and give them a second chance. Amen? Amen. And I'll tell you, this story really shouldn't be called the story of the prodigal son because he's not the hero in this, uh, in this, in this story. Uh, the, the, it should be called uh, maybe the, the story of the loving father because the father's the hero. The story represents exactly how God deals with you and I when we're in rebellion. Amen. And when we come to God, He does just as His Father did. He gives us a second chance. He takes our lives and He, and he remolds them and refashions them and, and makes something beautiful out of our men. 
And this story has a happy ending. The son came home, the father did everything right. You know, in his grief, he watched the son hurt himself, he watched him make mistakes, he, he let him reap the results, he prayed and waited and committed. And when his son finally came home, he accepted him lovingly and unconditionally, and he forgave him completely. And this story has a happy ending. But I'll, I'll tell you, the jury may be out on some of our children. We don't know how our child is going to end up. And some of you might have young kids at home, and, and, and you're starting to see the first signs of rebellion, and it scares you to death, and you think, I can't control this, and you can't. Some of your kids right now may be breaking your heart, and maybe they've rejected everything they, that you hold dear, and, and they've spurned your values, and rejected your God, and hurt you, and you're embarrassed, and you're angry, and you wonder why. And my word, my word to you today is to give that hurt to God. Because do you think God doesn't understand what it's like to have rebellious children? He understands. He has a bunch of them. And he knows exactly how you feel. So give your hurt to God. And I'll tell you, I, I, have, I have been, uh, been kind of uh, on my mom here today. My mom done everything right when I was in that prodigal way. Because she followed that pattern. She, might, she didn't even know. But the hero of my story is my mom. Amen, brother.